How did how did you end up in the storm? By the way, gotta ask. Man, I I, had, I didn't have power for like five days, so that was sour. Um, that was really bad. <laughs> no power for <laughs> five days, and then uh, but I, I mean, you know, for my family it was sour, but for me it was actually kind of cool. I felt like I was in another country, um, like in a you know being like on a tour in a weird south of Copenhagen or south of Denmark type tour with no Wi-Fi. So I, you know, I was kind of at peace with my thoughts, but of course having a daughter. And a family in the middle of that, you try to make the fun out of it as much as possible. Yeah. So, um, but we were cool. We got everything back. Got it, you know, internet and everything back last night. You know, I kind of worked on some music. You know, I played on my piano downstairs, and then and then when I got power back, we didn't have internet, and so we didn't have any t- any, you know, any television or anything like that. So I was like, you know what? I'll just come upstairs and uh, work on some more music. So I just kind of, you know, tried to make the best out of it, bro. Mm-hmm. Are you able to work on a lot of music during this whole thing, uh, during this whole pandemic? At the beginning, no. I was not able to work on anything. Um, it was kind of tough for me, to be honest, to even focus on music. But eventually I got my act together and uh, and basically started playing music, you know, at a high clip. So essentially, like, you know, when I started playing in my house more and like start developing more music lately it's starting to come forward i'm starting to write more music and so for the past month it's starting to really kind of ramp up you know mm-hmm. getting ideas in spite of the fact that i won't probably share them for a while you know <laughs> <laughs> do you write albums like do you get an album together and then start recording or do you kind of well i, I try to think about an album i just think mm-hmm. about tunes and so i think about tunes so when the tunes come up the tunes kind of just start to kind of flow in a certain nature. And then the tunes start to collect as well. So like, mm-hmm. you know, they'll flow. And the next thing you know, I'll have a batch of four tunes. And then I have a batch of six or seven tunes. Then I have a batch of 15 tunes. And then I start thinking about an album, you know? And mm-hmm. so like, it, I have to wait till I feel like I have a batch of songs that have a message. Cause for me, a batch of songs come in a moment. They come like, from from a message from how you're feeling from how you're inspired in that season in your life uh or a concept you know that's how songs form so uh, to you know you don't think about an album right right away but there's some time underlying feel that happens like right now what i'm working on is super inspired by the 70s and like soul music and like trying to figure out how to capture soul music and improvisation along with like a uh a very honest message of humanity and like, you know, perspective of life, you know, being a married man, a husband, father, going through life, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's what this album is kind of dealing with. And, and it's a different part because the past two albums I've put out, they've represented that time for me, you know, and where I was the discovery, my first album, I was just trying to figure it out. I was just trying to like find a good batch of tunes that I felt represented who I was. My second album, I had more of a message more of original music. Now it's like all originals. It's like, you know, conceptually I'm honing in more and more on who I am as an artist and really what I want to say and how I want it to sound, mm-hmm. you know? So, yeah. Yeah. So a uh, little background, how long you been in New Orleans now? Man, almost 10 years, bro. Um, I've been married for going on 10 years. So, yep. 2011. <sighs> I think 2011, August 2011. So I'm coming pretty close on to 10 years here. And um, it's been great, bro. Um, the city has taught me a lot, you know. So, and you took kind of a, a roundabout way of getting here, right? You didn't come straight from uh, from Florida. You kind of went to New York first. Yeah, yeah. And New York was a short time, but it felt long. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was touring. I was working so much there. And so I felt like I was in New York way longer than I actually was like physically in the city. Um, but my career kind of started there, especially when it comes to musicians that I was working with. That was that's the nucleus of the scene. And at that time, that's that's really New York was huge for me, you know. Uh, and then I was able to kind of get out of there relatively quickly um, from spending tons of time there for rehearsals extended stays i mean i was people didn't know where i lived at to be honest and it was it was that way for about i would say about six or seven years people are now just realizing i live in new orleans but for a long time nobody knew where i lived (laughs) you know 
So uh, did you move there right out of undergrad or did you, was it that nebulous thing where you were kind of there, kind of not? I was in okay. Tallahassee for a year after school. I stayed in Tallahassee. And during that year is when I was in that never, like kind of in, kind of there in New York. I was like kind of going back and forth. I was still in school. Well, no, I was out of school, but I was finished with college, but I was touring with, with Carmen Lundy. Mm-hmm. And so I will always be in New York. And then right after that year is when I kind of, you know, planted my feet in New York and lived there. And then shortly I came to New Orleans. Um, I got married, too. And so that kind of changed the tide for me as well. New York wasn't quite what I saw for my family as well. So, you know, it just it uh it kind of naturally flowed. It really did. It naturally kind of like everything kind of like led its way here to New Orleans, you know. OK. So what was what was the record that opened your mind to jazz? Ooh, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, I was. I, I was. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I was just gonna give a little context because neither you or I were actually like maybe we might actually be almost a year apart. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, neither you or I or most people that we know started with jazz in the house, like you know, in the fifties and sixties. So I'm just wondering. It's got to be a question for everyone. What what broke it open for you? Bro, that's a great question. I think that's the truth, too. Nobody had jazz in the house. I know I didn't. None of my, I, mean, I have nobody in my family that was playing jazz in, in my house, in my family. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say the first record that really kind of opened some gates for me, like really, really opened it up for me. I would even say, you know, common record would be Miles Davis, Counter Blue. That started it. Then Milestones, uh, Miles Davis. And then it started to kind of open up a little bit more. Uh, Our Men in Paris, um, uh, Dexter Gordon, you know, listening to Kenny Clark on drums, that opened me up big time. Gene Amons, Boss Tenor, um, the record with Art Taylor on drums. That, that, that was the nucleus. I would say those four records started it off for me. They got me to understand how to hear how to think, how to listen to what we call jazz, how to like really understand how to ingest, like digest the music and respond in a, in a very, very um, authentic to the genre way. You see what I'm saying? Um, yeah. Coming from playing gospel music all the time and playing in church. I was playing piano and, you know, I grew up playing. Uh, oh, I got to stop doing this. Darn. So, I left my keyboard on. I changed my keyboard. Oh, dang. That's two days I did that. So anyway, I left my keyboard on. So it's been on since yesterday. And I just realized my keyboard. <laughs> anyway, I grew up playing piano in my grandfather's church. He was a pastor. And so as he played piano, I played piano and I was kind of like just playing whatever. I was playing everything, man, music in general. And so for me, growing up hearing gospel music, you know, you just always around music at a high clip. And so getting my hands on jazz records, it was easy for me to play the information, but it was actually difficult for me to understand the information, um, the musical language. And that is why I would say those four records kind of really brought things home for me in my mind for how to hear. Mm-hmm. So how does this culminate in you starting to play drums? Because you just said you started playing piano, right? Yeah, man. I started playing piano first, and then I started singing, of course, at around the same time. Drums, to me, you know, of course, playing, I, I took it seriously right around like sixth grade, seventh grade, middle school. That's when I started to really get serious. And um, it was like my principal instrument. I never took any lessons with piano except for, you know, college, you know, taking jazz piano and stuff like that. Um, and actually, we had jazz piano in high school as well. Um, and so, but drums became like kind of like my spirit instrument, you know, over time. It just became like an instrument that I had a unique voice, uh, an approach to playing it. And so um, when I got in serious about drums, I was, I was like, I would say middle school. And then when I got to high school, it definitely started to hone in. Uh, because that's when a lot of those records I just told you started to kind of come into fold for me. And I started to mm-hmm. take it seriously and understand the difference between playing a, you know, a 22 inch bass drum versus an 18 inch bass drum, you know, like, like, under, like basic stuff, man, the stuff that you learn. It's like, you don't just, nobody just gives you a bebop kit 
at 10. If you do, hey, more power to you. But I didn't have that. I had a Yamaha stage custom, you know, that I still mm-hmm. have. I still own that kit. I had a Mapex white kit, white make it, Mapex 22 inch bass drum, 12, 13, 16, you know, one of those like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I came up just, you know, playing drums, not jazz. It's funny. I don't know anybody that first got a stage custom that doesn't still have it. Bro. <laughs> killer yeah. kits, man. And I, and I got a couple of them now. Now it's like I got the one that I had my first stage custom kit, and then I have one that I keep. I used mm-hmm. to we don't tour anymore. We don't play gigs anymore. <laughs> but I have a, a stage custom kit that I kept in my trunk, and it had. It's funny because I would take. It has a, uh, a 18 inch bass drum, 12, 14, and I have a 16 inch floor tom that I keep with it as well. And it's like a perfect kit to carry around town, to play gigs hardware you know and mm-hmm. then, uh, and uh so and then I, yeah man so i'm with you on the stage custom that's like <laughs> yeah bro it's the go-to yeah it's just still still on every gig in new york too yeah. <laughs> almost every single one it's crazy mm-hmm. but you've had a couple uh really unique experiences uh, i was wondering if you could take me through them so what is the betty carter experience like i know you did that in 2009 that's a really select experience every year for, for people. So if you could tell yeah. us about that. Man, you know, people don't ask me about that, actually. People always overlook that. And I'm glad yeah. you asked me because um, people overlook the Betty Carter Jazz Ahead. Everybody goes through that, man. If you look at the rap sheet on who has been a part of that residency, I mean, it's long. I mean, they, they, they have an eye for the right people. I'll just say that. Um, when Dr. Billy Taylor, rest his soul, well, Nathan Davis, rest his soul, James Moody, oof, um, uh, Curtis Fuller, the staff was crazy, man. That's how I met Carmen Lundy. Mm-hmm. Carmen Lundy was on the staff at that time, and I remember applying for it, and I had to submit original compositions. And this was a first for me in, in, in college because, you know, as a drummer, writing and composing, you don't really think about it. You know, you think it's kind of like something you have to do because you're getting the same degree that the horn players and the piano players get. <laughs> but that would open the gauntlet for me. My com- my compositions, realizing that my compositions could hold up amongst uh, other people and that I had an understanding of harmony. This is also going back to my piano playing. Mm-hmm. And my compositions, being going there and getting tutelage from those people and listening to the competitions and working them out amongst high level musicians, extremely high level. They only choose three drummers. They choose three rhythm sections. So three drummers, three bass players, three piano players. They may go guitar. Sometimes you never know. They 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 choose three vocalists. They choose three groups of horn players. They basically make two jazz groups, three jazz groups. And you play all original music written from from by everyone in the band. And man, everybody would bring in everything from odd time meters to like super long form movement pieces, swing. You would have some of everything. So you're reading and you're intensely playing perspectives of other musicians that are in your generation. That changed the game for me because then it told me that I had a voice that was deeper than just playing the instrument. And just being around all of those geniusly talented musicians, man, writing like at a high level. I mean, writing that week, two weeks at the Kennedy Center. You know, you got to send your GPA. You had to send your it was pretty intense, man. Mm -hmm. And to just be in two weeks in the Kennedy Center, like being like cooped up with people, 14 days working. And I think it's less now. Now it might be seven days. But back then it was 14 days. And it was just. It was great, man. I, I, some of those relationships I still have, and to see some of those cats and some of those musicians still playing gigs out here today, you know, um, that was really big. That was the first time that I ever saw myself on a national stage uh, amongst people who could really play. And I was Florida State had a lot of great musicians, but being at this situation with these people, it was like the level was high. And that's how I met Carmen Lundy. Carmen mm-hmm. Lundy came. She came up to me and said, I want to work with you. And I was like, what? <laughs> and, bro, I always tell this story about this. I, I didn't have any business cards at the time because I was young. I was like 17, 18 years old. Mm-hmm. And I remember her being like, I want to work with you. So I was like, man, I'm going to have no business cards. Bro, I went to Kinko's. Remember Kinko's? <laughs> <laughs> I went to Kinko's. We getting old. I went yeah. to Kinko's. 
printed up these little blue cards with my email address, my name, and I basically was like, she said, do you have a card? She asked me that. And I said, yes. <laughs> and little did she know, I had then cut up like freaking wads of these little blue cards from Kinko's down the street from Embassy Row mm-hmm. uh, Marriott. It's still there. Every time I drive, bro, it's still there. And I down the street, I walked down the street, got these cards. And um, I never forget that because that was my first time, my first passport, my first time ever having a gig with someone who I didn't know. Showed up to rehearsal in New York. You know, Anthony Wanzi on piano, who's been play, who playing with everybody at the time. Yeah. You know, Nicholas Payton. You had uh, Daryl Hall on bass from Paris. Um, sometimes it would even be um, when I first got on the gig, Robert Glasper would, was had just got out of the band. So it was like a really cool time, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and so I met a lot of people through her, man. Patrice Russian. She was because she was kind of like a purveyor of the music in a way. She was like super strong female Betty Carter energy, like, you know, swing this music, you know, mother, you know, like, you know, yeah. like get cussed out on the bandstand kind of energy, <laughs> you know? So yeah, man, that's Betty Carter for me though. I yeah. wouldn't be where I'm at without it. Mm-hmm. So what was it like on the road with Carmen? Cause then now that you're on, on the road with your own groups, well, not, not right now, but in general, you're out on the road with your own groups. I mean, yeah. what did you take from that experience? Um, professionalism. Mm-hmm. You know, I learned how to be a band leader with her. Um, I learned how to 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 kind of lead by action. I learned how to like follow the mood of the band when it comes to like what I decided to talk about musically. You know, she didn't say much. She didn't talk about musical things that happened on stage. She embraced mistakes at a high clip. You know, and what it did was it it opened it up for me to be free as a musician. Everybody, we were really free on stage with her. Like stuff was going everywhere, and she'd just be like, "Yeah, bring it." You know, when you were when you were not coming with it, she'd tell you. So it's like it wasn't specifics. It wasn't about specifics and concepts and sounds. She loved my approach to playing the instrument, which is why she called me. So I didn't get a lot of information about like details. It was just bring it. You know, bring it, bring who you are to the bandstand. And so I even remember coming to the gig the first couple of nights or the first couple of tours in Europe where I was kind of reluctant because I was in jazz school <laughs> studying jazz <laughs> where I thought that I had to approach her music playing swing and kind of like, you know, being very authentic to and true to the style and the genre. Her gig showed me that this style of music that we call jazz is large. It is because musically, uh, compositionally, what she was writing was completely different from studying with someone like Marcus Roberts and Jason Marcellus at Florida State University. You know, very mm-hmm. different conceptually. And so I had to really get blown through the torches, like put in the fire to develop as a young musician and how to bring my approach to the music and not try to play Art Taylor or Art Blakey or Tony Williams. Like, no, you can't do that. When you're in a lot of the fire, you got to bring yourself to the music at a really intense level. Uh, super aware, super attentive, using things like dynamics and, and and rhythmic choice and tone, like all kind of stuff. Like that stuff is what you learn on the gig. They can't teach you that in a lesson. They can't. There's no possible way. You know, and getting on her gig just blew. I, I mean, it made my musical brain connect from from my natural instinctive ears of learning music to all of that education that I was receiving from a lot of my professors, it all started to be like, you know what I'm saying? And that's yeah. where I'm at now where I'm just kind of like, this is how I hear it. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. Wow. Um, so now to the next big thing, I got to ask about Monk in that competition. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a big thing. You got a record deal out of it. Man. How was the monk competition like? Oh man, nerve wracking, bro! <laughs> I remember the day I found out that they were. Who, doing who were the judges cool. that year? Oh, Ben Riley, rest his soul. Oh man, um, uh, Brian Blade, who I rode on the airplane <laughs> with and rode to the bus with on the way to the venue. Uh, Vinny Kaliuta, you had Kyle, Kyle, Carl Allen, Roy Haynes. 
and uh, Billy Drummond. There was somebody else too. Oh, uh, Jimmy Cobb. Damn. Yeah, bro, it was heavy. It was one of the most heavy. Let me tell you, it was so heavy. And you know, drum drums drummers bring out like it's like yeah. light show camera action. Mm -hmm. So when they announced that it was gonna be drums, bro, every drummer on the scene was like, "Oh!" And at that time, you gotta think, cats are young. I'm I'm 22, 3, 23, 20, 23 years old. You got like cats like Corey Fonville, Joe Dyson. I mean, the list of mm -hmm. drummers was really young. Like you you just knew Justin Brown. You just knew that it was gonna be ridiculous. You know, Marcus sure. Gilmore. Like you knew it was gonna be a big power because it was just like this, you know, the drummer commodity thing, you know? Yeah. Man, my I, I I never forget I was recording a studio session with Barry Stevenson, a good friend of mine, bass player mm -hmm. who played on my second album. And he was like, bro, the monk competition for drums this year. And I was like <laughs> And in my mind, I was nervous. Oh, no, nah, I'm, I'm not doing it. My wife was like, no, you got to do it. And so I did. I got a trio together. We put some music together. I, I did one take and sent it in. And the rest is history, bro. It was just amazing to be around that much talent. I mean, bro, the drummers, some of the drummers from out of the country were just ridiculous. Like, everybody talks about, like, you know, Justin, Justin Brown, Colin Stranahan, Myself, Kyle Poole. I mean, there was, was some great drummers, and and let's. Do, I mean, that and that. Those are the drummers that made it to the fifteen, right? That's not talking about the drummers who are auditioning before trying to sit in the tape, mm -hmm. and who. So the fifteen drummers that were there, there were some amazing drummers from out of the country who were playing circles around the drums, like just ridiculous stuff. But um, fortunately, myself, Colin Stranahan, and um, Justin Brown were the three chosen from the fifteen. We get to the final round and uh, we play 15 minute showcase. Uh, Avery Fisher Hall, which is like this, not Avery Fisher, but yeah. um, Alice Tully, not Alice mm -hmm. Tully, shoot, Terrace Hall, something like that. Yeah. Kennedy yeah. Center, Kennedy Center. Yeah. <laughs> we play 15 minutes a piece. I played original music. Um, Justin played it. Justin played and Colin played. It was amazing. And man, when they called my name, bro, I was just like, whoa. Like it all happened really fast, but the camaraderie am amongst the drummers was great. It was just ridiculous, you know. Mm -hmm. Like it was, um, it was a special time, bro. And uh, and we all took different routes to our careers, um, and have different approaches, which, mm -hmm. which, which is refreshing as well. Um, but which is also pretty unique in a competition competition to have that many because I know of Colin because when I was going to UNC. He was in Denver for a while, and you hear this name, Colin Stranahan. He's always the lefty, right? <laughs> oh, he beat me. <laughs> he has me a up. really different, different approach. You know, Young Arts, the Young Arts uh, Awards, bro. My mm -hmm. senior year, Colin, he he got the actual drummer slot for Young Arts, and I remember hearing about him. And you got to think, I was the guy. I mean, I, I'll say this. I mean, I got certain opportunities, but there was a lot of opportunities that I didn't get. So, like. Um, Grammy band, you know, a lot of those. I didn't get a lot of those, man. I didn't get it. So for me, I felt like I was the underdog. I felt that way. And what's funny is the New York Times article when I won the competition referred to me like an underdog. It was hilarious. Really? You know, yeah, but I was touring at the time. I was playing with Carmen. And I was like, bro, narrative is something, right? You yeah. know, like they just referred to me the the the, the black sheep of the competition. Like, <laughs> like what? Yeah. So Professional and, and, professional drummer who's been touring for years comes out of nowhere. Yeah, <laughs> comes out of nowhere. Like really, and so I, I mean, I remember at the time too. I was pretty. I mean, I had endorsements. I, I was like in. The, I was in a good space in my career. I was in New Orleans, and and after that, I remember being in grad school in New Orleans. And bro, grad school went by like that after that competition. Like <laughs> because you gotta think, touring happened. I got a lot of performance opportunities. You know, I started getting a lot of sub calls because cats wanted to play with me. So, like, McBride called me on the phone. Christian McBride's like, hey, Jameson, man, how you doing? You know, cats are like, cats wanted to play. You know, I was in New York a lot. So the expectation of my approach was really high. People wanted to see why I won. I remember that feeling, you know. I never I never really tried to, to, to think about it, but I remember just being at Smalls and cats calling your name, like, come play. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, I'm getting a drink, bro. Like, I'm chill. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, but that's that edge. That's that yeah. that that New York edge that always you hear educators talk about getting, which is kind of like the confidence, 
you know, the mental fortitude and confidence to play. And to have a certain kind of edge with your ability, man, that is really what people talk about with New York. It's not the hustle and bustle. or the, No, it's, it's you having confidence to hit the crash symbol on beat one. <laughs> you know, so that's really what it comes down to. And uh, I'm, I'm happy, though, I experienced that. It changed my life, bro. I mean, I, you know, I didn't I spent the money pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> But but um but I did get that record contract, which gave me a, a platform now that I have, which is a lot of listeners, people who are listening to me, not because of the drums, you know. And uh-huh. so it, it kind of segue to where I'm at now, where I kind of have this duality of a career that I'm trying to bring, you know, closer yeah. together. Uh, speaking of which, it's actually my next question. How did you develop singing and not just playing drums, but playing jazz because that's that is a unique thing I, like even at your sandbar you you really could only say great tape but i don't know if grady ever played and sang at the same time i know he had two different careers yeah there's definitely not a lot of examples so i'm kind of out here by myself um and so you have drummers who can sing uh who play jazz like you know Jeff Tang Watts can sing you know but but to play and sing at the same time and kind of explore this rhythm and melody relationship I got to give my guy John Baptiste some credit you know he's a good friend of mine uh um and I remember being on the road with him shortly after I won the mug competition for two years we traveled and played in a sprinter all over the country it was amazing that was some good times for me he was a risk taker and he was also very innovative in his thinking about what was special when it comes to individual people. And he would make me go and start the shows singing and playing like a Beatles song by myself. And I would be like, what? And the first time I did it, I sung Blackbird by the Beatles and I'm singing and playing. And I was like, yo, this is actually, cause it's how I thought. I've always thought about the music in a melodic way. I've always, even when I take drum solos, going back to some of the first records I played on, everything is, I think, melodic. I think max i think like you know fun kind of quirky approach mm-hmm. to the drum kit like frankie dunlap you know like i want to make a scenery kind of thing happen where the drum solo doesn't feel like a bunch of notes you know mm-hmm. and so wh- the way i would do that is i would do it with my voice um early on in my development i would sing my drum solos while i played them so that's how i would breathe and, and capture my phrases the way i needed them to and I remember Leon Anderson told me, my teacher at Florida State University, he said, you're on to something with that. If you can do that and master it, it gives you an extremely unique sound to be able to play and play clear phrases and have clear identity in your approach. And so I stuck with it. So this is that was the beginning of it. When I started traveling with Baptiste, I've always grown up singing in church. That was a gift of mine that I feel like was just given to me. But as everything started to kind of add up together and my experiences started to match the gifts that I had, the concept naturally evolved, you know. And so me singing and playing drums, no, there is no blueprint. And quite frankly, I don't know if I've put enough time into practicing at this point. I just started doing it. So at this point, I'm just like doing it. And this next phase of my career, I'm actually going to put some more time into practicing doing it because the singing and the drumming is getting increasingly difficult to do <laughs> together. So now it's like, cause I'm hearing grooves and concepts and song concepts, and I'm hearing lyrically and rhythmically what's happening and they're getting more difficult, which means it's going to take some independence study mm-hmm. to get them to work together, which of course I'm down for. Cause if I can put it off, then it just opens up the ceiling on how I can improvise, which is the real nucleus and core principle to this rhythm and melody that I like to do it, you know? Yeah. I, have you had to reach outside the genre a lot just to find examples uh, or yeah. to find, cause I know Le- there's a lot of leave on helm videos out there and uh, not so much of Don Henley, but I know leave on talks about it a lot or talk about it a lot. Yeah. Buddy, buddy, buddy miles is somebody who I really like. I mean, he bro, the way he opens up on a kid is special. Um, I, I, I love, um, I, the another thing is too. This is not with me singing, but something I like the way I love the way singers play the drums, like the way Shaka Khan plays the drums, the way Stevie plays the drums. Mm-hmm. They have a certain kind of touch of the instrument that's extremely soulful and funky, and it's not hard. But there's a certain wiggle to their playing where they're not thinking about time; they're thinking about 
feel. So with my voice, I like to do that. I like the time to kind of go where I'm singing. So that's something that, you know, kind of has made it difficult for me to choose band members as well at times. Uh, but um, <laughs> but it but but it's a really natural kind of evolution that's happening. I don't know where I'll be 10 years from now with this, but I do know I'll keep pushing it forward. You know, yeah. is it is, was that on your mind when you did have to start dealing with the Concord stuff? Of you definitely wanted to make it a singing thing, or was did that have to be pulled out of you? I'm gonna tell you, bro. The Concord stuff was crazy because, you know, I don't think they really, bro. They, I think, you know, some of the label people knew that I could sing, but I don't think they expected to put out a vocal record. Mm -hmm. I think they expected to put out a jazz drummer's record, right? And I think for me, I had to prove to them that I could sing. I never forget. Chris wanted to hear. Chris is the a &R guy mm -hmm. at Encore who did both of my albums. And I remember he wanted to hear me sing. So I, I got like some guys together at the studio at UNO because I was still in school <laughs> to record some demos. <laughs> and I now that I think about it, bro, I don't know why I did that. Like, <laughs> because I'm like, what? No, you want me to get demos? You pay for it. Like, <laughs> Now I'm thinking about it, like I was so naive, bro, because I would have never did that. I was so eager to prove, you know, mm -hmm. oh, let me prove to you that I can do, you know, even the way it worked out for my favorite because it worked. I did that record in my first album. It, I think it surprised everybody at that label, you know, and it surprised me as well, honestly, mm -hmm. but it surprised everybody. Um, I knew that I could put a good record together, but I didn't know how to. It was my first time. And mm -hmm. so for me having the talent to do it and was able to put that Nice swing of that first album. It was a big deal. I mean, I toured. That set my touring career off big time. Booking agencies and all, the whole nine. I had every, you know, Europe agencies, all kind of stuff. That, I mean, still now, that's, you know, my inquiries come off of those, not that first album. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, how involved are you on the business side of it? Like, how involved are you in talking with the record company or, or the A&R guy? Um, Okay, I'm pretty involved. I'm pretty involved. Mm -hmm. So most artists have a, a, a hand on the pulse of their career. You should. If you don't, then you just, you, you, you know, you got to have a hand on it, you know. And the reason why you do is because the, it, it's inspired. Your career is inspired by your creativity. So if you don't have a hand on your career, then that means that they're going to be out of touch with what you're creating. And so I talk to my manager almost every other day. Mm -hmm. um, my, now management has, has expanded. There's a team of people, but my manager is the number one person that understands my vision and what I want to do and achieve. And so we come up with a plan on a regular basis of how to attack that. Now, when that plan is, can't, you know, uh, when that plan is solidified, of course, I'm out of the question, you know, but I think my team understands exactly what I'm trying to do. Therefore, I can back off and allow them to work, you know, at this mm -hmm. point. Um, at the beginning, when I first started out, I talked about everything with my manager. We talked about contracts to um, to, to advancing to like uh, riders, you know, what I want on a rider. Riders changed over and over and over again. It was amazing, you know, how, how much this stuff changed just mm -hmm. because you're learning. You're learning on the fly. You're learning what you need when you show up to a city, you know, when you show up to a, a festival. Like, what do you need to put on the rider? And it's to the point now where our rider is extremely thorough. Drum heads to I got the model numbers of the hardware that I need. I have, I mean, everything, bro. I got all kind of stuff, you know, in there, monitor pack, all kind of stuff that I, you know, you name it, it's there. And that has happened over time. So my pulse and my hand on the business is very firm. Which agents I want to sign with. I left my first agent now and went with another agent because my music was starting to change. And I wanted to get an agent that could get me in rooms where people didn't sit down. Maybe they stand up, you know? Mm -hmm. That's a different type of agent. You know, you want to get on the ground and tour with gear. You know, like all of these things are things that I had to really like grow with. And I had to have a pulse on my career business wise in order to be able to move that. If you don't, uh -huh. you can't move it because you'll stay w where you're at and you'll just take the gigs. Oh, yeah, I'll go play a little cabaret gig in New York. No, I'm not playing a cabaret <laughs> gig. No, I'm freaking I'm not even 50. Why should I be playing a cabaret <laughs> You see what I'm saying? Like you gotta yeah. be careful. You gotta be really careful with that. So you know, and everybody gotta be working on the same machine. And the way they work and how they're fueled is through you. 
your music, sure. how you, what you talk about, what you say, the kind of artist you are, it's all motivated through you. And especially in this independent world that we're in now, it's like, it's all you. It's all you as an artist. So how have you developed that part of, of your business life? Is that all experiential? Is that just learning from doing? Or is, is there a lot of, do you actually sit and, and spend time on your own uh, thinking about those type of things? Like how, especially in interviews, uh, not necessarily like this, but with publications or anything like wh where you're, you are becoming the face of your own brand. Um, it, it all starts with what you're creating. That's the one thing I'll tell anybody, man, what you're creating is the number one piece to the puzzle. And so for me, you don't ever want it to feel like work. If you feel like you're clocking in, that means that something's missing. Either you're doing too much or you don't have enough passion about what you're doing, you know, and you got to check the reasonings why I'm big on that. You know, I've been wanting to do like a virtual show, show this whole pandemic, but I have not had a reason why to do it. Neither have I had the unction. I, I don't like why? What, what, like, I don't. Would it be for followers, for for fans? No, that I never do stuff like that. Like it's always inspired musically by what you do. So I'll tell anyone, bro, start with what you're creating and be completely, completely transparent to that thing. And when you do that, you won't sell yourself short because the minute you start thinking about all the other variables, like, you know, you know, that's when things get really intense, bro. That's when you get frustrated because you're not touring. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like you get frustrated because no, no, you got to put the work in. And so for me, I do, there are some days where I don't want to talk business and I'll tell my manager that man, today and it's not a good day, you know? And when I have to talk business, you got to codify that brain. And, and, and when you stay in that moment of inspiration, you'll always have the right answers. That's the thing, you know, everybody around you will, they just got to get to know that inspired person because that's what this is, is art. We're creating it. So handling the business side, it's not always easy. But you just gotta stay inspired about what you're handling. If you stay inspired about it, about it, then you'll 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 find ways to have fun doing it, and won't let it kind of employ some work ethic on you. Cause that's the thing; it'll 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 kind of pull you down, man. If you you find yourself kind of in this pandemic time, is tough because everybody's you know displaced completely, and um, especially emotionally and mentally. So it gets like kind of a, it starts being a twirl where you're like, did I make the right decision? Like you start asking yourself crazy questions about just artistic development and practice in general. And so I just think that staying inspired, being patient, let it come. Don't force it. Don't for I'm learning that big time, bro. Like I've been trying to write music for the past pan the whole pandemic. And now five songs, I wrote five songs in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Like what? And they're all like, I'm like, oh man. And, I, and it keep coming. It keeps coming. I'm like, okay. All right, now it's clear. Now you know what I'm saying. Like, just be patient. Like, it's okay. You know. Yeah. Um, man. So, what what advice do you have for people who are trying to start groups now? Because you've been leading them for like the last eight years or so, kind of on and off, but in large chunks. What advice do you have for people who are starting groups? Um. That's a great question. Ask yourself why. I think ask yourself why are you starting the group? Make sure you're clear about it. You know, it's okay to start a group just to play some music. Like I don't want to make it seem like we 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 have to have a super thorough uh, perspective on life to start something. No, no, bro. If you just want to put some music together for cast to play and experiment, period. If you just want to play some gigs, but I think having a reason why and having just knowing what you're trying to do, it just prevents you from getting self yourself wrapped up in what people tell you that you should be doing. Because that's what happens to a lot of band bands and bands that start. They start listening to outside noise. But what you have to do is get people on the same page of what they want to do, what they're trying to achieve. And that is the ultimate goal. Everything else falls in place. The issue is when you get somebody in a band, someone starts a band or a group of musicians starts a band and the agendas start to add up. Mm -hmm. And when all the agendas start to add up, 
that's when stuff gets weird, bro. That's when it gets people. That's when start people start checking out and be like, uh, I don't know if this is something I'm trying to do right now. You know what I mean? <laughs> like you hear it all the time. Either that, and then also too, like understanding the market of where we're at in the music industry. You gotta understand that. Like knowing where we are. Like if you're gonna start a funk band, you know you got a tour. Like you're gonna put out an album. Like have attainable goals. Write it out. What's the first place? Rehearse. Okay, let's mm -hmm. rehearse. Okay, after we rehearse, let's get some tunes together. Okay, we feel like we got an album. Let's come together and record an album. Oh, okay, we got a good album. Okay, start from there. So is this album gonna come out? Website. Okay, let's let's see if we can actually play some shows in the city. Like have a succession of plans and achievable goals for you to actually reach for that can really like give you motivation to keep going. That's big, man. You know? Yeah. Um, I do have kind of a nuts and bolts question for you to ask you. When you record in the studio, do you overdub your vocals or do you record at the same time? Because I, I know you have the contraption. It depends. It um it depends. So some some sessions I am singing at the same time, depending on the song. But some songs need some kind of pre post production done, and then singing has to happen after the show. Like this next session that I'm going to come up with, I'm recording in November. I'm actually recording next week, next Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Wow, and uh, I'm recording here. The band gets in town next week. We got we're going COVID test for three days, and then we're going <laughs> get in the studio for for three days. And that's been a whole process getting that together, management. You know, like yeah. and um. Long story short, I'm not gonna. I'm only one song. I'm actually gonna sing first and then lay the drums. Okay. And there's, an, there's another couple other songs where I'm gonna not sing but play my demo tracks while we play and then go back and lay the vocals. So all, all closer to like a, almost a pop record. Yeah, oh. because because the sound you're trying to get, like I'm what I'm trying to capture is something a lot more produced record along with live energy because i could actually do a record without my band at all but mm -hmm. i need to capture them playing with with us because then you do that and you put the vocal and no one even knows it then a dentist and that's a real it's a technical question but even as a producer as i like to think you know you got to be keen to that kind of stuff because BGVs and stuff like that. You, there's no way you can lay all that stuff live in one take. You can, and I can see us as a band doing this in the future. Mm -hmm. But we're gonna have to tour like crazy to do it. Yeah, it just takes it takes a lot, a lot of time to get that tight, right? Yeah, like like we're gonna record. I'm gonna do. A, I'm doing a video on Friday for a jazz festival, right? Mm -hmm. And in the video we're gonna record the video. I'm gonna record the video for the festival, playing a lot of my older music, and I'm gonna record it all. So I'm going to record it all in the studio. I guarantee you that stuff is probably going to sound ridiculous. It's probably going to be like, you know, classic. But that's exactly why you record. I mean, that's exactly why you tour. When bands tour and they record nightly, Snarky Puppy does that, man. When we on the road, live in Rio record that we did, bro, they're recording every night, mixing on the bus on the way to the next city. Wow. Like, so what happens is you just all of a sudden have three records. That are great. So that's how you cut records where you're doing everything at the same time. You got to be, you got to play them all the time. That way you're not thinking about it. The moment you got to think about the red light, it gets weird. Mm -hmm. How did you, you start playing with Snarky Puppy? Did you meet those guys while you were uh, going in and out of New York? Because I know they started up there, New right? New Orleans, man. New Orleans. Yeah, man. New Orleans is great, bro. This place, bro. <laughs> Bro, I was, let me tell you. So I already knew Sput from just the scene mm -hmm. in general. Drummers, no drummers. Yeah. Michael League and Chris Bullock, the tennis saxophone player, I went to the show to play at the Mason, and I was hanging around everybody, and I had just won the Monk competition, and Bullock, the tenor player, and Bob Reynolds, who I went to high school with in, Jack in Jacksonville, they basically were like, Yo, you know Mike, man. You know, man. This is Jameson, man. He won the monk competition, and Mike was like, "Oh man, what's up, man?" So we just started talking. Mm -hmm. they, the monk competition was like this super weird <laughs> interview because everybody just thought I was just like, you know, 
this clown. I'm like, bro, what? Like, I'm like, I'm I'm chilling. So, so they thought I was just like super phenom. Bro, what the heck? I hate that. Long story short, though, I ran into Snarky on the road with Cecile. I was on the road with Cecile McLaurin Savant playing in uh, Nice, France. And if you know about Nice, France, actually, this was North Sea Jazz Festival, but we were all on that European circuit in the summertime. Mm-hmm. It's, everybody's on this circuit in the summertime. It's crazy. We get to North Sea, and I play with Cecile, and Michael League and a few of the band members came to Cecile's show. And Cecile's show, you know, it's like, you know, suit and tie. It's like super, you know, straight ahead. Very, like, you know, a lot of old jazz, modern, 1920s, you know, a lot of perspective there. And so Mike came to the show. Mike was like, man, come to the jam session tonight. So I go to the jam session at like 3 o'clock in the morning. Larnell, everybody's hanging. It's a bunch of drummers. Justin Brown, Justin Tyson, uh, uh, Ronald Bruner. Bro, when I tell you it was a hang, it was like hang. Mark Giuliano. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a hang. So we're there. We're talking. I get there. I go play drums. The session is on YouTube. It's on live. One second. One second, bro. This is my daughter. How you doing? Okay. Did you finish your lecture? Yes. Okay. I was there. I went to the jazz festival, went to that night set, and I played a 20-minute funk jam that you can actually find on YouTube. Type in Snarky Puppy North Sea Late Night Jam, and you can actually find it on YouTube, bro, where we're playing for 20 minutes. Me, Mike Lee, Christian Sands on, like, Rhodes, Bobby Sparks. It's a hang. It's like at Bird in Rotterdam. And next thing you know, I was in Europe maybe two, three weeks later with John Clary. Um, mm-hmm. play. Oh, yeah. I was playing with John Clary and this was a really high peak time for me touring wise I was touring like crazy during this time and it was my my daughter was just born and my mm-hmm. tour schedule was intense I'm talking about, like the kind of tour schedule where you're leaving like the day after Thanksgiving mm-hmm. coming home a couple like it was it was intense I got to John Clary Chadwick Mike Chadwick is the manager of Snarky Puppy but he also owns Band on the Wall in Manchester London Okay. So he owns Band on the Wall, which is a very known club that everybody goes through and plays, right? So he comes downstairs and says, Hey, man, what are you doing November 14th through the 7th, um, through the 27th? And I was like, uh, Nothing, man. Uh, Mike wants to know, can you do a run with Snarky in South America? And I was like, And here I'm on the gig with John Clary. That's what was deep. <laughs> So John's downstairs, like, and John's very, like, nervous about his musicians, like, going, because he doesn't want to lose. When you get a band sound, you don't want to lose it. And I had just started working with John, too, and I had learned his whole book, which is a whole nother thing. Learning music, bro. Huh. This time, bro, long story short, I took the gig with Snarky, bro, and the rest was history. They kept calling me back. They called me, and they kept calling me, calling me. Then they made me official member of the band, told me, welcome to the family, and I was on the last two records, the, um... Immigrants and uh, I forgot the other one, but yeah. Family Dinner Volume Two. So I just been now I'm officially part. I was doing Ground Up Festival from the first inaugural Ground Ground Up Festival. So it's been four years now that I've been a part of Snarky. So right. I, and I take it that they their schedule is enough where you can do your own thing as well. Yeah, because Larnell's still there and JT still there. So what it is is now they've created a collective because they tour so much. They switch out those rhythm section players for all of the tour okay. days. So there's multiple guitar players, there's multiple bass players. I mean, sorry, multiple drummers and multiple keyboard players, and they swap that whole section. Same thing with horns. They don't take all the horns on every show. It's only two horn players technically. So. Um, the band travels with nine members, along with like a I'll say a eight person crew. Mm-hmm. Eight to nine person crew, which, as you know, when you have nine people, when you have a crew, have nine crew members on a tour, it's a pretty fun tour. It's pretty easy. <laughs> you know, drum techs and lights, and it's crazy. It's yeah, just show up and play, right? Oh, bro. Oh, bro. Let me tell you. I'm talking about show up and play at the highest level. Like, send your drums. Bro, I have a Yamaha kit in storage in New York. I have one of the new Yamaha Oak Customs. The, mm-hmm. the hybrid oak. I have one in storage in New York with Snarky, and so whenever the tour bus leaves, they just pick up everything from the tour from the the shed. They have like a little storage area, studio area, mm-hmm. and and they just bring it. And so if I need new heads, 
the management roles, they call, they call ahead. They want to, like, they just keep, bro, it's crazy. And I learned a lot with Snarky for this reason. Like, the way they operate, man, it's just like a find all machinery, bro. Like, you know, and um, it's cool. Like, it's really cool. I remember because I, when I got that kit, I had just got, uh, I think it might have been, what, what, I have a hybrid hybrid maple maple hybrid kit that I had just got. This kit is actually the newest kit that I have, yeah. but the hybrid maple kit I just got. And when I started touring with Snark on the Road, I called and was like, "Man, we need a kit." And I thought they were going to kind of trip, like you know. And bro, they were like, "Oh no, no, it's cool." They sent the kit, and I was like, "Dang!" So what's funny is I actually was going to get the kit home, but I don't have any more space for it mm-hmm. because at this point it's like you know what I'm saying, but. <laughs> That that band really changed the game for me though in regards to because you gotta think being in a jazz field kind of like energy, you know. They also showed me how to tour on the ground. Like when my band started touring on the ground, it was because I watched the way Snarky did it. And mm-hmm. they do it. They do it. It's efficient, you know? So yeah, man. Yeah. I, I do uh ask drummer nerd questions. What are you playing on now? Because you've been a, you've been a Yamaha guy for a long time. Oh man, I don't play nothing else, bro. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I almost bought. Yeah, this. you're never gonna be one of those drummers that always switches out a different snare drum, like like Bill Stewart and, and Ludwig. <laughs> no, I, I love Yamaha, man, and they're so consistent, bro. They are like the most consistent drums. I mean, bro, yeah, bro. I, I could get, I can get everything right now. I was in here the other night and I took all the bottom heads off except for these to mm-hmm. get a certain sound because the way I was trying to record and um. I'm playing right now. So the recording custom is what I put on my router because the recording custom to me is just like it has my soul in it, the way it sounds. Um, uh, but so, you know, Sabian cymbals, of course, um, these are like two. This is a 24 inch HH King cymbal. This mm-hmm. is the one of the new complex, you know, the new complex 20. Uh, that's a 22 inch complex crash. Sabian complex. Sabian complex. Brand new. It's crazy, man. Yeah, it's called it's called a complex, HH complex. They have them in like, it's really amazing symbol. So it's like a twenty two inch crash, and then uh, there's a um, a monarch, a Sabian nineteen inch monarch crash. I don't know if you mm-hmm. know about those. And then yep. right here is an artisan. Uh, the hi hats are sixteen inch elite hi hats uh, artisan. So and I mean, there's symbols everywhere in here, man. Like, long story short, a uh, Vic first sticks. Uh, I used to play Remo heads for a long time, and I switched uh, about a year ago. And yeah. Went to, yeah, that was a tough move for me, I, but I had to. It was, it was. It, Man, I'll tell you what, I put UV ones on mine. The bro, chain changed the game, <laughs> bro. I, I had that the UV two is what got me. Yeah. That's what. That's what the UV twos, bro. I put those. Let me tell you something. It changed the game for me, bro. I was like, okay. And then I'll, I'll just be honest, too. Their artist relations department is just ridiculous. Mm-hmm. It's hooked up. And Aaron, he he just, bro, I, Remo, I had love of Remo, but Remo was, it's an older system. So they're very, um, I love Remo heads, too, bro. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not going to lie. I'm a huge Remo fan. But they don't get, they're not inventive. They're not like, you can't find crazy heads. Like, you're going to find, like, <laughs> no. Bro, yeah. Remo, I can find, bro, I can go crazy. Not Remo, but Evans. Yeah. Like, I can go crazy with heads, bro. Like, this is a calf tone. This is an EMAD calf tone head. <laughs> Think about yeah. that. You know, I got a crazy head. drums. <laughs> yeah, crazy make, heads. yeah, they can make anything you want, bro. I got these heads down here. I can't get to them. But I basically had red hydraulic heads made. With the EMAT technology. Mm-hmm. So like when I'm in the studio and I want like a really thuddy sound, it's got EMAT rings on all of the red hydraulic heads. Bro, you mean to tell me I can call Diodario and say this and they have it to me within a, two weeks? Like, come on, man. You can't beat that, you know? And so Aaron really, he really sold it because I was going on tour with Snarky and he was like, bro, tell me what you need. Just send me what you need. So I sent them a list. And bro, they st- it was like four boxes showed up to the tour, and so I started playing them on the tour. And when I got finished with that tour, I, I took them. Bria Skomberg had a gig, and we we did an orchestra date in uh, Vancouver, 
and I had some heads sent there to play on a jazz, like a more jazz thing. Mm-hmm. And I sent the, uh, I think I used the, I used the G ones. Yeah, the originals. Those those heads, especially in a jazz context, they're really great. Actually, mm-hmm. they're really good heads. To, to you know, and I think I had G twos, G ones, and an EQ three frosted on the bass drum or something like that. They, like, see what I'm saying? Like, you hear all these heads, bro? Like, that's, for me, it sold me. I was mm-hmm. like, okay, all right. You mean to tell me I can go through all these heads? And that's what I do, bro. I just keep, and I have an allowance every year. And so what I, typically what I do is, and I haven't even used, oh, shoot, I need to use it. Oh, <laughs> uh, I'm glad you reminded me. I need to get it. Because it's year to date. And if you don't use the allowance, they just start it over. But I'm definitely about to use this allowance. <laughs> Oh, I'm gonna see what I can get. Okay, so oh, I'm glad you. I'm glad. I I'm glad we talked. But anyway, yeah, man, that's the drums. Um, um, yeah, bro, Yamaha. In, um, Reunion Blues. I love Reunion Blues. I have, I have a few bags by them, and then mm-hmm. uh, SKB cases. I have them out in my yeah. shed. I use SKB for like you know road cases and uh, yeah, bro, yeah. Oh man, thank you so much for doing this. <laughs> Yeah, man, anytime, man.